Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started with uh, the final keynote of uh, the conference. I'm Doug Josephson with uh, Intel here in Fort Collins. And uh, just a couple of reminders before we start, should be any recording or taking pictures of the slides and stuff, um, please silence your cell phones. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Dr. Jim Warnock. He's a distinguished engineer with the IBM Systems Unit. Uh, he received a BSc degree from Ottawa uh, University in Canada and his PhD from MIT. And since then, he's been uh, with IBM in Yorktown uh, Heights, working on high-speed microprocessors, including uh, the Power 4, uh, cell broadband engine, the Power 7, and uh, several Z-System uh, designs. He's got a cool Z-Systems Design 3D uh, label on his laptop. Uh, check it out. Uh, his interests include uh, VLSI circuits, clock storage elements, DFT, and design and technology interactions. And he's a member of IBM's Academy of Technology and is an IEEE Fellow, please uh, welcome Dr. Jim Warnock. Uh, thanks for the introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank the uh, committee for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So, uh, there's a. It's down a little right here. Oh, yeah, I just went to Windows 8 myself, so I'm still getting used to it. Yeah, yeah so. still on. Resume slideshow. Uh, it's there. Was it up? No. Yeah. Oh, the little thing oh, didn't come that's up. That's funny. Didn't show yeah. you. Okay. All right. You good? Yeah, I'm okay. good. There you go, sir. Okay. Let me just uh, turn on the uh, uh, laser pointer here. I'll get this. Uh, what's this one? Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the digital circuit design challenges that we expect to be facing when we're designing the next uh, generations of high performance microprocessors. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about this from a, a IBM Z and P systems perspective, but I think most of the observations that I'll be making will be relevant for uh, server design, microprocessor design in, in general. So um, let me uh, start by just uh, giving a brief um, outline here of what I want to cover. Uh, I'll give a few introductory remarks, and I'll talk about some of the challenges, uh, design complexity, uh, some of these new device structures that we've uh, heard a lot about recently, how these uh, play into the picture, and then some of the power, thermal reliability, uh, some of the issues with interconnect, interconnects, and then I'll give some uh, conclusions. So let me start with a quick introduction. Uh, so I really like this uh, slide from the ISSCC 2013 supplement, and it really shows uh, a trend, and you can really see a pretty sharp uh, break here. Um, you could see uh, frequency scaling, and then up to uh, this point about uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, things really flattened out, and it was pretty uh, dramatic, pretty pronounced, and it's been uh, pretty flat uh, since then. So flat frequency for the last decade, and then uh, moving forward, if I uh, squish this all over and uh, put a few more points, uh, I put some points here now from, uh, uh, from later dates. You can see things are uh, staying pretty flat. And I expect this trend to pretty much continue. The high end uh, of these microprocessors will be in the four to five gigahertz range. Now, uh, it's, it's not so much a trend as a constraint. Um, we'd like to uh, lower the frequencies, but the software is probably not going to progress to the point where uh, we can get away with um, dropping that frequency. So I expect for the near future, we're going to be uh, constrained. We've got to continue to operate up in the 4 to 5 gigahertz uh, regime. So there might be some uh, slight ups and downs, but I expect this trend uh, to continue. Uh, now, um, this, uh, this brings me uh, to this uh, uh, scaling issue. I think we've heard a lot about uh, scaling, and I think people are already aware that um, if I plot the, the uh, technology voltage versus the feature pitch, uh, scaling is as uh, kind of deviated from this ideal, uh, this uh, straight line on the log log plot like this. This dashed line is kind of the ideal scaling. Uh, we've deviated from that. The technology um, is uh, 
is really not scaling the voltage. In fact, um, this, this region, this is the classical Denard region, um, and this is the scaled voltage. If you, if you look at the high performance designs, we actually push um, quite, a, quite a bit above the nominal, and we're actually pushing, uh, pushing as high as we can just to get that performance. And that creates this gap, uh, voltage gap, between the voltage we're running at and where we'd really like to be from an ideal uh, scale point of view. And this voltage gap puts a lot of stress on the design in uh, various ways. It causes power issues, thermal issues, reliability challenges. And as we continue to smaller feature pitches, of course, this dash line keeps going down. This voltage gap just keeps getting larger. And the physics uh, behind all this won't let you keep growing this voltage gap forever. In fact, even for high performance systems, this voltage is coming down uh, kind of slowly. But this gap and this growing gap is a source of many of these uh, difficulties in the scaled uh, designs. Um, so um, just to summarize, uh, so this uh, classical scaling, classical Denard scaling is ended. It's probably not news to anyone by now. In retrospect, uh, you could see it's uh, pretty obvious. And this is basically the source of many of these challenges. Uh, even this design uh, complexity challenge is kind of related to that because we're throwing many, many more transistors at the designs now to try to get performance. You can't get the performance from just scaling frequency, so we're uh, doing new things with uh, transistors, and the designs are increasing in complexity. And then also, as uh, scaling has, uh, has uh, run into difficulties, the design rules themselves have become much more complex. Uh, and then in addition, there's uh, power, and thermal issues, reliability issues, and a lot of issues with interconnects that I'll talk about later. Now, um, in response to some of these challenges, on the technology side, we're seeing new device structures, new materials, um, so new solutions there, but they also pose certain challenges to the, the circuit designers. And then, of course, everybody's uh, wondering how far can we continue to shrink things. Uh, I'm not going to give a definitive answer to this because there have been a lot of those definitive answers in the past which have turned out to be wrong. But um, I will give uh, some kind of uh, perspective on how I think things will continue at the end. Uh, so let me go on and talk a little bit about the design complexity issue. Uh, so this is also from the ISSCC 2013 supplement. And this is this really nice illustration. This, this uh, dashed line is the 2x uh, per two years. That's the Moore's Law line. And then uh, these are uh, just data points from the conference. And you can see it's uh, still going strong. In fact, if you uh, continue, squish this over and put a few more points, I put uh, data points from Intel and IBM here in 2015. You can see this is still going. And it's probably going to keep going for a while. Um, but like I said, I'll, I'll say a little bit more on that later. Um, but for the near term, you can expect this trend is going to continue. And that, uh, that means that the design task, uh, the complexity, is going to continue to increase. It's not going to level off anytime soon. Um, so um, this, is, um, uh, this, is, this increasing uh, chip complexity uh, definitely has uh, implications for circuit designers. Um, the technology uh, value add is now really coming from the quantity of transistors, um, much more than the, uh, the frequency or the performance of those transistors. So um, we need to, uh, uh, we, we, it's, it's no longer about pushing to higher frequencies, but of course we still have to maintain the existing frequencies more or less. Uh, now, um, the digital circuit designers need to keep pace with this uh, technology, which means that they have to be able to handle larger and larger numbers of transistors. Uh, it's got to uh, keep the frequency from slipping, and that means that we're going to have to really worry about power um, and power-optimized designs. Um, now, uh, this is true even for the highest end servers, the System Z uh, servers. We really have to worry about uh, optimization for power. Power turns into a performance at the end of the day. Now, as the circuit designers are pushing uh, more and more transistors, they're picking up methods from the chip integration team, so things that usually we were uh, relegated to the chip uh, integration methodology now have to be handled by the digital circuit designers. So um, things like uh, floor planning, uh, embedded IP, buffers, uh, all these special wires, uh, 
These all have to be handled by the circuit designers now. And circuit designers are generally moving to higher levels of abstraction and higher levels of uh, design. And this requires a deeper understanding of the, the logic there. Now, I got this, uh, this data from uh, Carl Anderson in uh, a talk that he had put together. And he was just highlighting the fact that um, as time goes on, the uh, circuit uh, designers have become more and more productive. He uh, gave these uh, rough numbers. So starting here, uh, I'm not going to go back to the bipolar gate arrays. That's a, there's a little bit of a disconnect between the bipolar and CMOS. But you could see, um, starting with uh, custom and design, where designers would be doing thousands of transistors per year. Uh, and then uh, as the tools mature, synthesis takes off, uh, library cells, structured synthesis, large block synthesis, the numbers just keep increasing. And I thought it would be cool to plot these numbers on a log plot and see how they compare to uh, Moore's law. And actually, it, it works out really well. Um, the blue dashed line is the Moore's law of 2x per two years. And these green bars are uh, Carl's numbers. And you can see that uh, things, uh, things track pretty well. So um, the good news is that the circuit designer productivity has really been keeping pace with Moore's law. And it's, uh, I think it's likely to continue. Uh, EDA folks uh, and circuit designers are, uh, have a lot of uh, techniques. And they'll, uh, they'll be uh, probably able to keep up with uh, increasing design complexity. And I think also this is it's not really a coincidence that this is uh, matching Moore's law so well. Um, I think uh, the teams are driven hard by uh, necessity, uh, so we're, uh, we're required to keep up. Uh, so that's the, that's the perspective I think uh, you should have here. Um, so now I put some charts here from, uh, from IBM, some of the IBM designs, and how, we've, uh, uh, how this translates to uh, specific designs. So if you go back to uh, Power 6, which was in 65 nanometer, uh, and, and look at just the digital logic and look at the percentage of that digital logic that was done uh, basically with a, a synthesized uh, uh, engine. Now, um, of course, there may be customization within that synthesis engine, but there's a pretty distinct uh, boundary between uh, logic that's done via synthesis and logic that was done with uh, custom schematic implementations and then uh, maybe manual placement and routing. So uh, back uh, Power 6, about 57% synthesis. Uh, moving on to Power 7, 45 nanometer, you can see the percentage increasing, 73%. And then going up as we go into um, the 45 nanometer Z and the 32 nanometer uh, systems, the EC12 and the Z196, uh, Power 7 Plus and 32 nanometer, and uh, Power 8. And then finally, uh, Z13 and 22 nanometer, pretty much uh, just about 100% uh, there. Now, um, so that's, uh, this curve is not going to look uh, very interesting going into the future. I expect it's just going to stay up there around 100%. But you can see that there's been a, a big push. And these designs, of course, the complexity of these, these designs, the number of transistors has just been uh, steadily increasing. So you can see in a very concrete way how the tools have helped us uh, keep up with uh, this increasing complexity. And this is uh, an example that I have from the Z13. This is the, the vector floating point design. It was uh, built as uh, one large uh, physical block. Um, there's one uh, designer who was primarily responsible for this. Uh, so he used the various hierarchical techniques. But this is something that uh, would have required uh, multiple, many designers. Uh, there's a lot of blocks here that are all uh, implemented. This whole thing has uh, 1.3 million gates, and it runs at, uh, at 5 gigahertz. So it's really a testament, I think, to uh, how far we've come in the, in the uh, design uh, methodology and tools space. So um, let me just uh, summarize there on, on the uh, uh, circuit design and PD complexity. Uh, so the uh, density, the complexity, we expect that to con continue growing. And the design rules and new constraints will uh, add additional complexity. But I expect the uh, EDA tools, uh, they've been keeping pace so far. I expect they'll continue um, to keep up. Uh, so I don't think there's a, uh, I mean, it, there's going to be um, uh, new techniques and tools needed to handle tomorrow's designs. But um, I think uh, we'll be OK. And another uh, point here is that the circuit and PD methodology will continue to evolve 
Um, so there will be, uh, 10 years from now, we won't be doing design the way we're doing it today, for sure. Um, so uh, let me move on now, talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the new device structures and some of the impl implications there. Uh, so this is uh, my picture of a multi-gate or a FinFET uh, device. Um, I've, I've shown um, this kind of uh, 3D picture and then a cross section along the gate here. Um, so this, uh, these FinFETs, or TriGates uh, in this case, uh, TriGate FinFET, uh, they've been introduced at uh, 22 uh, or 14 nanometer node, kind of in this range. Now, um, this uh, gate has improved electrostatics, so it gives you a much better uh, device scaling. Uh, we get uh, less uh, drain-induced barrier lowering and a steeper subthreshold slope. I'll talk about that in a, little, in a little more detail because I think that's uh, very important to understand. We also get less uh, variability from random dopant fluctuations and overall more device current per unit silicon area because you can see as you make these fins taller, you don't take up more area on the silicon, but you get more device width uh, because the device width is determined by um, basically twice the height of the fin because you have both sides and then plus the top. Uh, but there are uh, significant design implications here, uh, power, uh, thermal, and variability. So um, I'm going to go in uh, and talk about that in a little, little more detail. Now, I think it's also important to understand the uh, scaling trends here. Uh, so how, how these devices uh, are going to be scaled going forward into the future. Now, I put scaling in, uh, in quotes here uh, because the, the way that this, uh, this design is being scaled is not really, uh, I think, uh, a traditional sort of scaling. So if you look at how this is being carried forward for future generations, uh, of course, you like to decrease the fin pitch, so get these fins closer together. That kind of seems like a natural scaling trend. So as you scale all the dimensions, you'd think that the spaces between these fins should go down too. And this helps to give more performance. You get more fins per micron, so more current drive per unit silicon area. And then you dilute this uh, capacitance penalty from what I call the gate overhang. So this region up here, the gate has to extend uh, above the fins. It's just there's a lot of capacitance between this gate and the source and drain. So uh, you really like to amortize that, uh, that penalty. And you can do that by making these fins taller. And these factors, uh, both the uh, increased current drive and uh, the dilution of that uh, capacitance penalty gives you higher performance. Now, for the same reasons, um, from a performance perspective, you like to increase the, the fin height. And again, uh, if you increase the fin height, you get more drive per uh, unit area again. And also, you uh, further dilute this capacitance penalty, again, pushing towards high performance. But this trend of going towards uh, taller fins as you scale the dimension is kind of counterintuitive. It's not a it's not what I would call a natural scaling trend. Um, so this is uh, this topology, device topology, is going to get worse and worse as you uh, as you scale into future generations. So eventually there will be some sort of process limitations there. But on the other hand, the fins itself uh, won't uh, last forever. So uh, I'm not sure which uh, which scaling will uh, will stop first. Um, but it is important to keep in mind that. Uh, this kind of scaling will have um, some pretty significant uh, consequences. So, uh, so now I've, I've, uh, I'm trying to show uh, one of the consequences of that kind of scaling on this chart. So on the uh, y-axis, I just have the aerial capacitance density and its uh, relative units, and on the x-axis, the feature pitch. And this uh, chart is for illustrative purposes only. It's not uh, actual data. but. Um, if you start with the planar devices, as you uh, scale the planar devices and the gate pitch is decreasing, the, um, uh, the, the cap capacitance density increases linearly as you get more devices in there per unit of silicon area. And uh, this is uh, pretty uh, predictable. Now, the interesting thing is when you go to uh, FinFET scaling, you're going to have a different slope. So there will be a jump as you go from the planar to FinFET when you're uh, getting that increased um, capacitance density, uh, the fin effect is, is what I call it. And then, but then uh, going forward into the future, because of the scaling trends that I mentioned, the slope is actually steeper. So now this capacitance density is not necessarily a bad thing. 
it can translate into actual circuit uh, density improvement, but I say uh, with some design effort because you don't get any additional wiring channels with that. But if you think about, um, for example, a, a large buffer that you need to drive a wire, you need a certain amount of, capa a certain amount of current to drive that capacitance. And as you get more um, device width per unit area, that size of that buffer is just gonna shrink. So you could see that you can get some uh, density, but since you don't get more um, wire channels, you'll have to work to earn that uh, improved density. Uh, now, this uh, definitely does give potential though for design power problems. Um, you know, you can cram a lot of stuff, a lot of device width in a small area, so you can get local issues and global issues, uh, and this may uh, drive you to uh, reduce voltage faster with uh, scaling than you would with uh, planar devices just to keep the uh, power and the thermals in check. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, so, uh, so moving on, let me talk about some of those uh, power issues. So um, as you increase this capacitance uh, density, also the uh, leakage density will uh, increase as well. Uh, this puts uh, definitely uh, stress on uh, chip power. And there's uh, always gonna be this voltage and performance trade-off. We have to maintain roughly constant frequencies, so you can't lower the voltage too much. Uh, Technology is not going to give you a, a huge boost in device performance, so we really have to work on the power aspect of things. I think all the high-performance server processors have moved towards um, integrated, uh, some sort of integrated on-chip regulation. Um, you see this in Power 8, also uh, Intel uh, server designs. And this all lets us um, have this concept of uh, on-demand performance optimization. Now, that means that you'll be pushing up against Vmax at, uh, at one minute, but then you'll be pushing against Vmin um, sometime later as you go into some uh, quiescent state. So, um, so really, uh, you'll, you'll push the technology at both ends, Vmax and Vmin. Now, um, for these uh, high-performance designs, I want to focus on a specific aspect of, uh, of uh, power consumption, uh, and uh, I want to talk about the uh, clock and the uh, latch or uh, flop uh, components. So this is um, a very important component for these high performance designs because as we push the um, FO4 of the design down, you can see that the number of clock storage elements, so latches and flops, is, is going to be going up. Um, so that means that the global clock uh, has gonna, is going to have more load on it. That's one factor. But at the same time, you're increasing the load on that global clock grid, a global clock distribution. You're also tightening all the requirements for it. So it might be fine to have a, a 25 picosecond uh, skew requirement if you're running at uh, 1 gigahertz. But when you're up at 5 gigahertz, you've got to push that skew down to something like... Uh, you know, several, uh, like five picoseconds, kind of in that range. And same thing with the clock slew. You have to keep a, a tight slew on the, on the clock grid as you go to these high frequencies. So all these things push up the uh, global clock power. And we've seen uh, resonant clocking appearing. Uh, this can give power savings of uh, up to 30 or 40%. Uh, and then also in IBM, we've used um, pulsed uh, latches and, uh, and uh, flops. So this is, this is another source of power savings. I'm gonna go into quite a bit of detail here because the question arises, okay, if you have all these pulsed uh, clock uh, flops, um, how do those scale to low voltage? The voltage has gotta keep coming down. Uh, FinFETs are gonna uh, push us to even lower voltages. Is this still gonna be viable, uh, viable circuit style? Um, so we've uh, moved toward these uh, pulse clock latches now for the majority of our clock storage elements. So um, on, uh, on Z13, for example, um, we had on the order of um, uh, several million of these uh, pulsed flops. Uh, so now we expect, um, uh, we expect that we wanna, we wanna push this further because if we had to go away from those, we'd probably take a pretty significant power hit. And uh, uh, like I said, this design comes with significant challenges for low voltage. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. This is one of my favorite areas of the design. Uh, so this is the, the pulse latch that we use um, in Power 8 and Z13. It's uh, pretty simple. 
Um, looks uh, looks kind of like a master slave, but it it's not. It has um, it's got a bunch of stuff for scan. But I think the the key point here is that if you look at the data path through this thing, it's about as minimal as you can get. We've got a transmission gate here, and then basically uh, uh, an inverter to drive out of this thing. So it's a very low latency design. Uh, we allow designers to uh, put a uh, local input gate here. Now, of course, there's uh, constraints on that gate, but it does uh, let you uh, avoid having to always have an inverter here. Uh, so this is really a, a low latency design. It's, it's good for ha having that low latency is already good for, uh, for power because it lets you uh, power stuff down. So even if it's not a critical timing path, we'll put this in there and then it'll let us power down the logic either upstream or downstream. Now, uh, another uh, feature of this thing is that there's just a single clock. When we're in functional operation, uh, of course, when we're scanning uh, for tests, there's two clocks. But in functional operation, there's just one clock here that's uh, clocking this transmission gate over here. And as long as we have this uh, uh, pulse generator shared among a reasonable number of latches, typically this is shared about uh, over about 25 latches, uh, more in some cases, fewer in others. Uh, you can get a significant uh, power reduction through this technique. Now, there's been some uh, confusion in the literature on these pulse latches. You hear about people saying pulse latches uh, burn a lot of power, but they're usually referring to designs where the pulse is formed locally within the uh, latch itself. And if you do that, of course, um, you're going to burn a lot of power you know, building those uh, pulsing elements into each latch. But if you have the pulse generator shared among a large enough number of latches, you can get some pretty significant power savings just by the fact that you just have one clock uh, being distributed to, uh, to the latch. Um, so now um, this design, of course, does come with some uh, challenges. And I put together this uh, kind of simplified chart um, for uh, some of the issues that you face when doing this kind of pulse latch design. Um, so what I've plotted here is I plotted the time. Uh, now the time, uh, I've got a tricky kind of axis here. So take the time that I want to plot and I convert it to FO4 and then I compare that to the pulse width also measured in FO4. So if you look at the, no the uh, nominal pulse width, uh, it's constant as you lower the voltage because FO4, of course, uh, in absolute terms is increasing. But the pulse width as measured in FO4 is about constant. But as you lower the voltage, the uh, variability increases. So I've plotted here also the max pulse width and the min pulse width for the required number of sigma. And depending on exactly how many uh, critical kind of situations you have, you might be talking about five or, or six sigma. Uh, but it's, it's actually a little more complicated than that because there's other uh, process skew issues that come in you have to, have to be taken into account. I'm kind of uh, glossing over that. Uh, but the main issue is that as you lower the voltage, the max pulse width that you can get um, somewhere in the design is going to be increasing. And also, the minimum pulse width is going to be decreasing. And on the right delay side, the right delay, the maximum right delay by the same token will be increasing, while the minimum right delay is uh, decreasing just by this variability. So you get to this point where the minimum pulse width is equal to the maximum right delay. And then you're going to start seeing failures if you go below that. And, uh, and that sets kind of the V min of the whole thing. Now, um, you could see that as you're going down, uh, the hold time is set by the maximum pulse width compared to the minimum right delay. So the hold times are uh, increasing uh, rapidly as you go down in voltage. And the, the painful part of this is that if you find that your uh, V min is not uh, far enough, is not low enough, the only way to increase it is basically to increase the pulse width. And when you increase the pulse width, um, that lets you uh, push it down, but it increases the, uh, uh, the, it increases the hold time. And there's really a practical limit on uh, how far you can push that. Uh, you don't want the pulse width to be more than about a quarter to maybe a third of the cycle time. Otherwise, you'll have too many paths uh, to, to pad. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the sort of trade-off that we're uh, facing. Now, you can see all of this and the V-min that you get, it's all determined by this variability and the spread between these blue and red curves. So um, any technology that reduces that variability is going to be a, a great help to pushing the V-min down. 
and this uh, v min is, is uh, pretty much 100% set by the variability of the process. So having said that, um, if you look at the FinFET uh, variability, uh, this, is, this is the really good news about FinFETs. If you uh, do these uh, Pelgrim plots and look at the VT sigma in, in millivolts, and you compare that to this uh, metric, which is basically the square root of the device channel area. Um, so you could see that uh, for bulk planar devices, it's pretty steep, which means that uh, the VT sigma is going up as the device area is going down. Uh, and then you get to um, the, uh, uh, you can see it gets better with the bulk FinFET, um, SOI FinFET. And if you go to an undoped SOI FinFET, you can see you get more than a factor of two improvement in the, in the variability for a given um, device uh, area. So that's a nice reduction uh, for FinFETs. It really helps us uh, push the, uh, uh, push the VMIN down. And the other thing that's uh, going on here um, is uh, the doping effects. And I've plotted this from uh, another paper. Uh, you could see that um, you really want to be in this range where the, the doping is as low as possible. And the nice thing is that um, the technologies are designed such that the, uh, the highest uh, performance device, which has the lowest threshold voltage, will have the lowest dopant and the lowest variability. So it's kind of nice that it works out that way. So where we want the highest performance, uh, we're also getting the lowest variability. It's, uh, it's a very uh, nice result. Um, now this is another uh, aspect of FinFETs, which is really helpful and really uh, helps us uh, at low voltage. And this is the, uh, there's two aspects here that I want to talk about, the dipple and the subthreshold slope. Now um, the dipple in these uh, SOI technologies that we had, these, this is a planar SOI technology up here at the top. And this is, um, it's got a pretty large dipple. And actually I put dipple in quotes here because there's actually a regular dibble, but there's also uh, floating body effects, which increase the uh, apparent dibble that you're gonna that you're gonna see. So you could see um, pretty big change in VT as you lower the voltage. Uh, you could see uh, the dibble here is about 160 millivolts per uh, per volt. So that's uh, that's pretty large. So what that means is as you lower the voltage, the threshold voltages of your devices are all increasing rapidly. So uh, makes it hard to go to low voltage. And you can't just optimize the technology for that low voltage point because, like I said before, circuits have to operate sometimes at high voltage, sometimes at low voltage. If you optimize the technology, you get a reasonable threshold voltage at low voltage. Then when you went to high voltage, the threshold voltage would go down below zero and the devices would be uh, too leaky to, uh, to be operable. So um, you can't really do anything about it. You're sort of stuck. But the nice thing is in the FinFET technology that uh, that dibble uh, decreases dramatically. So we're seeing a dibble of about uh, 40 millivolts per uh, volt here. So you can see uh, that, that's going to give you a huge um, reduction in VT at the lower voltages, which is where you need it. And the other important thing is the subthreshold slope uh, is also, that's the slope of this region, this subthreshold region here. Um, this was about 110 millivolts per decade in this uh, bulk, uh, I'm sorry, planar technology. And it's going to about 70 millivolts per decade here in this, uh, in this FinFET technology. So that means at the same uh, off-current leakage point, you can lower the threshold voltage uh, for the FinFETs. Um, so that's uh, another nice result. You can start out with a lower threshold voltage, and as you lower the, the, the supply voltage, it won't increase as much as it did before. So those two things are really, uh, really good news for low voltage operations. So um, with, with that uh, kind of technology, I think uh, these uh, pulse latches will survive for uh, at least several more generations. So it's uh, really good news, I think. And even for folks who aren't uh, using those pulse latches, um, other types of tricky circuits will still be uh, fine. So. Um, so just to summarize uh, some, of this, uh, some of these challenges here, I think um, the, the FinFET scaling will definitely stress the, the chip power and power density limits, um, but I think the FinFET, FinFET technology will allow uh, scaling to lower voltage, so it'll help us uh, mitigate the power. So these aspects, the steeper subthreshold slope, the lower dipple, less variability, these things all help. Now, 
This is a really a one-time boost, though, it's important to note. As you keep scaling the FinFETs, these things don't get better and better. So the subthreshold slope isn't going to keep improving. The dibble is going to stay about where it is. Um, so we'll, we will need continued uh, device performance improvements. And that's one of the motivations for this uh, kind of strange uh, scaling of the fin um, topologies. So the net of all this is that our tricky circuits uh, can, uh, can now be pushed to lower voltage. And this is going to be really useful for uh, power saving modes. So, um, uh, so now, uh, as you uh, lower this voltage, though, the biggest challenge, of course, will be uh, device performance. Um, we still need to uh, keep that uh, high frequency. Uh, we want to be able to run. Uh, we'll still be pushing to the highest voltage uh, offered by the technology to get that kind of uh, frequency that we need. Uh, so let me say uh, a few words about um, thermal and reliability as we uh, push the voltage up there. Those are the kind of things we'll have to be uh, worried about. Um, so um, starting with the thermal issues, I'm going to talk about some local thermal issues, so gate level or device level uh, kind of issues. So the planar devices naturally have a, have a good advantage over the FinFETs, and SOI planar devices uh, we still can have problems with uh, thermal issues because they're sitting right on an oxide layer. But the bulk planar devices, really thermal issues, not, not really a problem. Uh, but now moving to FinFET technology, um, both bulk and SOI have similar sorts of issues. Uh, both are going to be much worse than planar devices. And the problem just gets worse uh, with this sort of, sort of scaling that I mentioned before where you get uh, taller fins and get them closer together, you just get more energy dumped in a, in a finite uh, space, region of space there. And this is, of course, a bigger problem for high performance designs because we're pushing the voltage, we're pushing the frequency, pushing everything, and that leads to uh, larger thermal effects. But uh, I want to point out that this can still be a problem for lower frequency circuits. So if you um, have your frequency, you tend to uh, you tend to be content with um, larger slews on the outputs of your gates, which means larger loads. So if you have twice the load at half the frequency, you have uh, basically the same problem. So it can still be a problem even if you're not running at the highest uh, frequencies. Now hot devices are, are just bad. Um, there's going to be faster degradation uh, from uh, BTI effects, uh, hot, hot carrier effects. Um, but I think the, the thing we worried about most is that this may impact the reliability of nearby uh, interconnects, so contacts, vias, and wires, especially the interconnects used to uh, create that gate, whatever gate is getting hot. Uh, and of course, there are uh, temperature-dependent device characteristics, which, uh, which you may have to worry about. Um, so uh, this is uh, kind of a cross-section of, uh, we sort of see how these thermal issues come about. You have this, uh, you have these gates here, they're getting heated. Now this is a, uh, SOI fin fed, uh, so you've got this buried layer under the fins. And so the heat spreads out here. The gate electrode is a pretty good uh, thermal conductor. Uh, so it spreads out here, and it'll spread out also through the, the uh, wire uh, contacts and interconnects. But it all has to eventually go through this oxide thermal insulator, which is uh, uh, the primary uh, bottleneck here. Now, if you have uh, bulk fins, you can imagine this uh, thin material extending down to the substrate, but it's a very thin path. Um, it's hard to get much heat down there. So it does help some, but it's not a huge, uh, it's not a huge help. Um, so this is something um, uh, that, has, uh, that can give some pretty high temperature increases. So temperatures uh, up to, I'd say, 40 degrees C have been seen for, uh, for the metal above these hot devices. And 40 degrees C is, uh, is, is huge. Um, my rough rule of thumb is that you lose about half the uh, current carrying capability of a, of a wire for uh, electromigration for every 10 degrees C. So you can see 40 degrees C is, is really, if you really get that kind of heating, you're going to probably be in trouble. Um, so probably have to take some steps to avoid those kind of uh, temperature deltas. Now, um, as I mentioned before, we've already been um, facing some of those issues in our uh, SOI planar devices. In fact, um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, uh, in more detail. Um, so 
Uh, we, uh, we reported on some of that in, uh, at ISSCC. And there's various techniques that we can use. I'll talk about these on the, on the next uh, few pages. So let me uh, skip right there. So this is, these are some of the self-heating um, fixes that we did. And this is a, a chart uh, that just shows how we address the self-heating in those designs. So um, we, uh, we had some uh, uh, issues with buffers. Now buffers, since they're uh, uh, quite dense, these are where the worst self-heating uh, violations are likely to occur. So in a, in a core, we had about 350,000 buffers, and then we run all the workload simulations, get the switching factors, and then we look for, um, uh, for these high switching factor buffers. And about 1% of them are uh, what we would call high switching factor. Uh, so then uh, we screen these buffers by size. If they're a small buffer, it's not really an issue. The heat sort of spreads out to a local environment, so it doesn't really cause a problem. It's really when you have a, a large buffer, a lot of fingers together that you get into a, a problem. And then you're down to about 2,000 now. And then uh, we screen these. Um, so uh, first, uh, first technique is to assign stricter uh, gain and slew limits. So um, we, uh, now some of these will already uh, meet those limits, so no action would be needed, but some of them would be uh, not meeting those and they'd, they'd uh, need some uh, corrections. So this basically means we're limiting the capacitance that you can put on those buffers. So by limiting the capacitance, you'll limit the, uh, the thermal aspects. Um, so now um, these, uh, these uh, constraints here are basically assuming that the buffer is isolated. If you have two buffers, one, uh, one right next to the other, they're gonna get quite a bit hotter. Um, so we have to look for that. So then we go and screen by proximity and find these uh, situations where we have adjacent buffers. We try to separate them if possible, and then if they're inseparable for various physical reasons, then we assign even stricter uh, gain and slew limits on those. And then we were left with about 500 that needed to be fixed, and then we had some automatic resizing, which took care of most of them. Still had a couple hundred manual fixes that needed to be done. So, um, I think this, is, uh, this methodology uh, served us okay for uh, 22 nanometer, but uh, we're gonna need um, enhancements on this. 200 is probably a manageable number, but if this goes up to thousands, probably gonna be in, in trouble here. And this is another um, local power density screen that we built, uh, again, for the same purpose. Now this is uh, general purpose. Uh, this is applied across the whole design, not only buffers. We just looked for, um, local hot spots. So we had a tile, we moved it around, we were annotating the uh, current flowing through the power um, supply on the, at the via level. And so we just looked for regions where there was uh, unusual current density uh, through those uh, vias in a small box, figuring that if you got a lot of current, it's gotta be going somewhere, and it's probably gonna be going to something pretty local. And if you've got a lot of current in a small box, it's probably gonna get hot. So uh, we did that and uh, had to uh, review uh, unusual areas. And again, it was a pretty much manual fix-up uh, process. Um, so uh, I think uh, the key issue here is as we go forward, we're gonna need much more sophisticated, probably complicated methodologies and, and design tools for, uh, for tomorrow's thermal problems, something we're gonna have to keep an eye on. So we've been uh, driving the EDA folks to, uh, to really think about solutions here. Um, so let me say uh, some words about interconnects, because I think interconnects uh, are probably going to be one of the things that's really going to uh, limit our uh, eventual ability to scale our designs. Uh, so this is uh, a plot um, just uh, illustrating some one of the interconnect reliability issues. So uh, I've plotted the relative lifetime here on the y-axis, uh, metal pitch here on the x-axis, and the uh, black line is just... Uh, a lifetime if you're at constant current density. And the point is that even if you have constant current density through your lines, as you scale them, the lifetime uh, decreases quite uh, dramatically. But uh, actually, the uh, current density, the expected relative current density, which I plotted on the right-hand axis here, is actually increasing as you scale the device. And this is uh, part of the um, lack of ideal scaling that I mentioned before that drives these current densities to increase. 
So if you look at the lifetime expected with this actual increase in current density, then it's, uh, it's even uh, more severe. In fact, this doesn't include um, fin effects. If you throw on uh, fin effects, it probably pushes the current densities up because you're putting more device width per unit area of silicon. So uh, you tend to push uh, this curve up. This is the current density. And then the, uh, this uh, actual lifetime curve will just get pushed even further down. So uh, if you look in the IPRS, uh, they highlight the same issue. Uh, you may have seen this plot before. It's basically the same data in a different fashion. They're showing that current density just keeps increasing as you scale the feature pitch, continue, where the uh, lifetime keeps, uh, keeps coming down. Um, so and now they also uh, summarize some of the options for improvement. Now, uh, none of these options are free. They, uh, they have a cost. Um, there's various alloys, cap materials, um, so you could see that the uh, resistance uh, tends to increase as you improve the electromigration um, resistance. But you can see relatively large improvements are uh, available. And I think we'll be um, pushing in this direction. So you can see the, the trade-offs there. So uh, the net is that uh, I think uh, electromigration reliability will drive uh, considerable design effort, and that'll have to be tied in with the thermal analysis because uh, obviously uh, if the device is heating, it's gonna be able to uh, you know, have less um, ability to conduct current in the wires. Uh, now, the electromigration uh, limits uh, may get squeezed by uh, TDDB. I, I think there's sort of this triad of um, uh, triple constraint here. You have the uh, electromigration issues, you've got the interconnect resistance, and then you've got TDDB, uh, which is affecting the space. So it's, it's quite tricky to, uh, to find the optimum solution there. And I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when I get to uh, TDDB. Uh, now, uh, these, uh, this electromigration will require dedicated technology solutions, and I think um, they'll be forthcoming, but there's this trade-off with wire resistance, uh, as I mentioned. So it, it doesn't really seem like a, a brick wall uh, for continued scaling, um, but it will, uh, it'll feed into the constraints of the interconnect design overall. It's one of the three uh, constraints. So um, now this is one of the other uh, three constraints. This is the time-dependent dielectric breakdown. Uh, I got this curve, uh, this is a pretty recent result. Um, the thing I, I wanted to show here is there's two aspects of this. One is as the feature spacing goes down, uh, you could see that the lifetime, this is a, kind of a lifetime measurement, although it's a uh, scale lifetime measurement. You can see lifetime goes down uh, dramatically. Uh, you can improve things uh, with materials though. In this, this case, they have a higher dielectric constant and that gives you uh, improved uh, resistance against TDB. So there are material aspects. So again, um, the TDB is very strongly dependent on feature spacing, but there are some uh, technology knobs. Again, uh, it's always, um, this is always the way uh, things work to get uh, a better, more robust design, you gotta pay a design price, in this case it's uh, capacitance. But I think this kind of thing is, is likely, this is likely to be the thing that's gonna limit us the most for uh, high performance circuits, uh, VMAX. Um, we won't be able to lower, lower the voltage that much if we wanna keep the performance levels where we need them, and uh, uh, we'll be pushing right up against VMAX, and as the feature scale goes down, at some point, VMAX will be forced to come down, and then you won't be able to get the high performance that we need. So, um, so there's uh, electromigration, TDB, and the other one is uh, interconnect resistance. So those are the three constraints. So interconnect resistance, um, usually you think about this uh, as something that you can design around, and to some extent it's true, but if you think about um, just the resistance for uh, local connections, uh, it can actually be quite painful. So if uh, I plot an example here, I took um, uh, basically a, a scenario where I had a reasonably large gate and I'm trying to drive it with um, 1x wire, uh, local wire, not a very long wire. And I'm also considering some, uh, some via resistance there. Uh, and you could see that just the resistance, uh, the RC, uh, basically the resistance of that wire and the capacitance of the gate um, that RC increases very rapidly, 
And you could see this is uh, wire delay measured in FO4. So if you have a minimum width wire, uh, you can get a significant fraction of an FO4 delay just in the connection from gate to gate. And this is a very local connection, just a few microns, uh, although I'm scaling this as the technology is scaling. And so you, you can't, um, you can't uh, tolerate that kind of uh, increase. And even with uh, triple width uh, 1x wire, you can still see you get down to these uh, smaller feature pitches and you can see uh, you're getting uh, still a uh, reasonable fraction uh, of, uh, of an FO4 delay in the wire. And so this, uh, this is really uh, getting uh, painful even for these uh, short uh, local connections. So this, this will also tend to limit the scaling. So this is the triple constraint. So the way I think of it is if you start out uh, with your interconnect, you want to pick a, a low bulk resistivity because you can have a very small cross-section, but um, the uh, electromigration will, um, will force you to uh, increase that uh, resistivity uh, to some amount. And then you'll say, okay, well, now I've got a higher resistance wire. I really want to widen that wire, push the space down to the minimum, but things like TDB will keep you from uh, pushing that space down, so you have to open up that space, and then you, that'll squeeze the, uh, the constraints and then uh, you'll be stuck with uh, uh, basically a resistance which uh, won't, let you, uh, uh, won't let you scale your, uh, your design and, and still maintain that high performance. Uh, so I did want to say a word on uh, global uh, connections. Global connections, of course, um, uh, depending on exactly how you assume they'll scale, I've plotted the case for a, a fixed uh, absolute wire width and a scaled wire, uh, sorry, wire length and a scale wire length here. Um, starting from an arbitrary point here as a reference. And uh, reality is somewhere in between these uh, two. Uh, we don't uh, scale our chips perfectly because we're always adding more logic. Um, but I think this is amenable to uh, uh, design uh, fixes and also um, uh, technology. Uh, technology um, is, is able to address this by uh, giving us more uh, wiring levels. So I think you'll see a continued need uh, as the technology scales uh, for more, uh, let's say, non-scaled or thick wiring planes. But this is something uh, I think is, is not really a showstopper. So the global wire uh, connects, which uh, people usually associate with RC problems, I think those are amenable to technology and design fixes. It's really the local uh, RC connections, the local connections between gates, which will be uh, more problematic in that sense. So uh, let me summarize the uh, interconnect uh, challenges before going on to some uh, concluding remarks. So all these things, RC issues, uh, electromigration limits, these are becoming more difficult. Um, they're likely amenable to um, design and, and technology fixes, but with the cost. And I think TDB, or actually the combination of TDB with electromigration and RC, these are probably posing a more fundamental limit for our high performance designs. And I think at some point it'll be unlikely that the voltage reduction could continue without the performance loss, and that'll mean that we won't be able to meet that uh, frequency target that we have to maintain. Um, so, and of course, uh, we have the same old problems with voltage reduction um, about, uh, you know, the, the variability and, and those sorts of issues. Those will also uh, th those are uh, device limits, which will also uh, put some limits on how far we can reduce the voltage, but I think uh, we'll be more limited by the performance than the, the, the variability. Um, so I think the painful trade-offs that we're going to see are, are all going to be in, this, uh, in these uh, wire interconnects and the scaling of these interconnects. Um, so let me uh, wrap things up, give a, a few concluding mark remarks. So um, I put this chart together. Um, now, it's all uh, posed in, in relative terms, so I don't have to specify absolute dimensions, but this is kind of my, uh, uh, my uh, view on the future scaling for high-performance microprocessors. So uh, high-performance microprocessor, of course, has many different types of circuits on it. Now you have um, this idea of uh, systems on chips, and even our high-performance designs would have been called uh, systems on chips in, in earlier era. Um, so th these different components are all going to have uh, different issues with scaling. And if you look at uh, analog circuits, um, that scaling is uh, mostly finished. Um, 
due to uh, the non-scaling of those, uh, those components that they used. And that's led a push, of course, to move as much of this stuff into digital. Uh, but we've kind of taken that for granted. Now, as you go forward uh, further, uh, high-performance digital stuff will kind of run out of gas first. And it'll be uh, limited, like I said, by um, TDB and VMAX, although in combinations with those other things. But I think it'll still be possible if you're not worried about getting to the highest frequencies. Uh, it'll be still possible to continue scaling stuff for a lower frequency, a lower voltage applications. Uh, and that'll continue for some time until you run up against uh, uh, maybe some combination of this, these uh, factors, of variability, device limits, TDB, but you will be able to push that uh, a little further. Um, so uh, now I think memory actually offers the, uh, the best scaling. I think you, memory you'll be able to push even further, uh, maybe new uh, technology coming in, um, but I expect this to go uh, furthest of all. And so uh, on the chip, if you look at these things, as you um, reach these uh, limits, each one of these is kind of associated with a different voltage regime. So this also, uh, for ideal scaling, you'll really be um, breaking up the voltage domains on the chip. And so I expect that uh, that's gonna be a, a trend in the future. You'll have even more uh, voltage domains than we have today because you want these different, uh, different components on different voltages. And so um, that's, that's how I, I kind of see scaling. It was just interesting to look at this. As you uh, move up here, this, this would be high performance digital would be at the highest voltage. These would be at lower voltage, and these would be still lower voltages. It was interesting that this is kind of the opposite trend from the way you like it from a power performance point of view. A little bit perverse, but uh, I don't know what we can do about that. Usually like the high performance uh, stuff that's switching a lot, you like that at the lowest voltage, not the highest voltage. But uh, that's, uh, that's the way it works out. And now uh, one final caveat, um, uh, economic realities may uh, change this or may ac actually just delay the amount of time it gets to these points. Um, so I'm trying to look at things from a more, um, uh, let's say, uh, economic, uh, economic independence uh, point of view. Uh, so uh, last chart here, um, I'll just uh, summarize some of the observations that I made. Um, Design complexity, I think that'll keep increasing, but I think EDA and the circuit design community will rise to the challenge. Um, power, uh, I think thin technologies require design vigilance here. Uh, we have much higher capacitance densities, so uh, um, there's uh, potential for, uh, for problems, but it, it also gives us this uh, ability to run at lower voltage. Um, thermal and reliability issues, I think these are uh, new issues uh, are significant issues that will be faced in the future. And the interconnects and especially reliability are likely to limit the ultimate scaling of uh, high performance uh, digital logic. Although we will continue scaling with uh, further differentiation of uh, circuit types and performance levels and voltage domains. Um, so the net of all of this is, I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, there's uh, plenty of challenges ahead for uh, digital circuit designers. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Jen, for a great uh, talk there. A lot of great uh, simple takeaways that I think you brought to that. Thanks for that. Um, we have time for a few questions. There's a mic that will be running around. If you have questions, uh, please raise your hand. The uh, pulsed. Can you uh, please um, identify yourself? Sorry. Could you please identify yourself? Sure. I'm Paul Firth from New Mexico State University. The uh, pulsed um, latch. You said nothing about gate leakage, and it looks like a dynamic circuit to me. Uh, can you comment? Uh, sure. Yeah, it's not a dynamic circuit, um, and actually, um, you know, now in this uh, era of high K metal gate. Uh, gate leakage isn't nearly as much of an issue as it uh, as it used to be, and um, I think that's going to continue going forward. Uh, for reliability reasons, we uh, can't let it be um, a significant uh, electrical issue. So it, yeah, it isn't uh, dynamic. Um, if you look at this uh, design, um, you know there's always something holding this node. So when the clock is low, we have this uh, 
this kind of complicated feedback stack that holds the node at its uh, um, at its value. So, I mean, you have to make sure that this is uh, sized in terms of uh, you know provide enough current for all the leakage, and that's typically uh, a Vmax kind of statement. But uh. over here. Oh. Okay. Um, Can you identify uh, yourself, Nick, please? I'm Nicholas Price from EPFL Lausanne. Um, I would have a question, actually. I have two questions. First, regarding the Pulse Cloth Ledgers. Is this something that, uh, that a standard design flow would support? Like, especially would static timing analysis support this? Uh, good question. Uh, I didn't go into the details, but um, uh, we use our uh, IBM uh, static timing tool. And uh, it has a lot of special things that we do for these uh, pulse latches and special templates. I think, um, I think any uh, static timing tool can handle it uh, correctly, um, but um, I think it, it does take some special setup to do it. So I don't think there's anything unique about uh, IBM's uh, tools, but if you just take this thing uh, right out of the box and then uh, give it to the static timer, it's probably going to make a whole bunch of uh, terrible mistakes, and you'll have to uh, <laughs> tell it exactly what to do. So yeah, there's a lot of special things. Actually, the more difficult aspect of this, which I didn't get into, is, is actually the physical design of these, because we have to be very careful with the clock nets. We have very strict rules on the clock nets. The synthesis tools um, know how to handle this, but it's taken a couple generations to get the tools where uh, I really uh, feel confident and, and as the tools have gotten better, we've used more and more of these in the design. But you know, we have very strict rules on RC, on the loading of the clock buffers, and things like that, and noise. Um, lots of rules that the tools have to understand and, and obey. OK, and if I may pose like a second follow-up question to exactly this to the tools. Um, I wonder, synthesis in general got very physical aware in, in recent times, no, about um, about the whole the whole technology, but what it seems to lack is it, it seems to lack any behavioral awareness about how what the circuit will do. Most analysis is later based on a on a synthesized net list about like switching activities on all these things. Why do you think that is? Why 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 don't we have synthesis tools that are more behavioral aware? Well, I think um, to first order, um, it, it you don't necessarily need to know exactly what the circuits are doing now. Uh, it's true that um, uh, you could say that, uh, let's say, take timing analysis, you could say some paths are not real. And if it's not a real path, uh, based on the way the circuit is operating, then you shouldn't time it, and synthesis shouldn't optimize it. Um, but I think, A, it's pretty hard to figure out which paths are real. And then, B, it's not only a synthesis problem. The whole tool suite would have to understand this. Because if synthesis understood Let's say synthesis understood perfectly, uh, you know, exactly how the logic was and what was real and what wasn't real, and it optimized the design along those lines. But then, if your timing tool or your, uh, you know, electro migration or power tool, all those other tools didn't understand, they would just be telling you, "Oh, synthesis is doing something terrible here. Um, you know, <laughs> don't let it." Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's really a pretty complicated thing, and I don't think that's uh, going to change in the near future. I think we had a question in the back, right there. Yeah, I'm Shomik Maiti from Broadcom Corporation. Uh, did you uh, notice any head due to local EM fixing at the standard level, uh, level at high frequencies? I, I didn't quite catch that. The due to which? Uh, due to local EM uh, electro migration fix at the standard cell level at high frequency. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things we do in the standard cell to, uh, uh, to, to give the best electromigration uh, reliability. Because it, especially as you go into these designs, um, I mean, you might say, OK, I just do the analysis. I have um, a frequency. I have a voltage. I have a temperature. Uh, as soon as I meet those specs, I should be good. But the problem is that you also get this local self-heating, and that's kind of unbound. So the way, we, uh, the way we approach our library design is we use all the available metal that we can get and make all the wires as wide as we can where they're carrying DC current within the space constraints of the cell. 
And you know, usually uh, we're going to greatly exceed the electromigration requirement if you don't consider local heating. But then when you start putting local heating on there, um, you know, then then you start, you know, the limits start coming down. And and so that's so that's our approach because you can think of it, you can turn it around and say that we want to support the maximum temperature of each cell that we can support without growing the area. So that's uh, kind of our design approach because the higher temperature you can support, the fewer design fixes that you're going to have to make to, uh, to lower that temperature. Okay, then we have time for one final question. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, Matt, are you looking at fixing Louisiana? Can you wait for the mic, please? Mac DeBayumi, University of Louisiana. Now, uh, talking about the problem of interconnect, you're saying that 3D technology would be part of the solution there? Uh, well, 3D technology is, is really interesting. By 3D technology, I assume you mean this chip stacking, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's uh, interesting. It has some interesting aspects. But the problem with interconnect is really a very local issue. It's really down at the 1x levels. Um, you know, once you get up to the global levels and you're talking about um, uh, driving longer distances, then I think technology, we use the kind of unscaled wires. And uh, if we get into trouble, we can always get a couple more wiring planes from the technology. So down at the local level uh, where you're building a, a library gate or you're connecting two gates together, I don't think the 3D is going to really uh, help you. You're, uh, you're just stuck with those local wires. If you want the density, you have to use those 1x wires, and they'll be highly resistive. Okay, if uh, you have further questions, I'm sure Jim would be happy to talk to you during the coffee time here. Uh, please join me again in thanking uh, Dr. Jim Warnock for speaking. <laughs>